let's start with a fresh interview with the former Yorkshire cricketer Azim Rafiq. He fought back tears at yesterday's select committee hearing in Westminster as he detailed in front of MPs years of racial abuse at his county. In a harrowing hour and 45 minutes of evidence, Rafiq told of his anguish at what he described as inhuman treatment at Yorkshire. The sport as a whole is now facing claims of institutionalised racism. 24 hours, 24 hours on from that hearing, Rafiq has spoken to Sky Sports News and says he feels vindicated following 18 months of trying to tell his story. Azim, we've spoken a lot of times over the last 14 months and one of the things that you always said to me was, I'll never give up. Did yesterday vindicate that persistence you've showed over the last year or so? Um, yeah, hopefully. Like I said, yeah, I, well, I, I was never going to give up. Um, that's, I was very uh, confident in my truth uh, and what had happened and uh, it was important that not just for me uh, and my closure but for the, for all the future kids that I kept going and kept going, shouting from the rooftops uh, on them winter nights where literally no one was listening. Um, I feel yesterday, for the first time, maybe people have started to listen. One of the things that everyone heard, one of the most striking parts of your, your testimony yesterday, you said racism cost me my career. I saw you get very emotional when you said that. Even in your witness statement, it says the club's culture of institutional racism cost me my confidence, happiness, my sense of security and almost my life. To hear yourself say those words out loud yesterday, how difficult was that to come to terms with? Yeah, really difficult when I got asked that question. Um, it hurts, it really does. Um, I, I've tried to not talk about my cricket uh, throughout this process, but um, I think especially the white ball game, uh, my performances are there in front of everyone uh, and my leadership skills as well. It, it does hurt, but like I said yesterday, uh, whatever's written for me and clearly this was written for me and I think this is bigger than any runs or wickets I could have ever got or any World Cups or Ashes as well. Did it feel like that at any point last night when you maybe had a chance to think about it, the magnitude of what you've done? Um, I mean I spoke to my dad and my wife and that was nice, uh, they were proud and I didn't really, I, th I don't think I'm really still that aware of how uh, much as it struck home with so many people but like I said it, oh, we've got to make sure it doesn't become about me and it's more about how now we listen to because I do feel there's going to be a little bit of floodgates and a lot of victims of abuse are going to come forward and I, we need to listen to them, hear them, support them and then work out a plan as to how we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again. Well let's talk about some of the feedback I guess you've had since yesterday. Um, some of the people named within that evidence will have known for months that they're implicated in this. The Andrew Gales, the Gary Balances, the Martin Moxons. Any of those main names, have they been in touch since yesterday? No, um, and I don't expect them to be. Um, I still don't think any of them think they've done anything wrong, which is quite... It just shows them for what they are, uh, the arrogance uh, and the complete disregard of anyone else but themselves and their views. Um, yeah, like I said, a lot of people have known. Uh, that's why some of the apologies are... It's, I mean, anyone that apologises, I accept. Um, that's all I've ever wanted, but... It does make you think, like you've known this for a good 14 months, uh, if you were genuinely sorry, you would have done it. Um, and, but like I said, anyone that apologised deserves a second chance. And that includes David Lloyd, who I believe spoke to you last night. What was that conversation like? Yeah, he, he rang me last night. Um, I told him honestly what I thought of uh, his comments. Um, they were completely out of order. He, um, I feel like he was briefed, well I don't feel like he told me he was briefed by uh, someone close to the club, uh, which is disappointing because even that gentleman doesn't know me that well. But I think the overriding thing was he rang, he apologised, I accepted his apology and um, he's committed in this space to make a difference and that's a positive. Um, there are other names that, that came up within the course of you giving evidence yesterday and, and you were asked about Joe Root and you said he's a good guy but w do you think we're now in a society where it is no longer acceptable to, to turn the other cheek, to pretend or say you haven't heard something or to, to allow racism to continue even if you're not directly involved, you have to go and put a stop to it? Yeah, like I said, um, Root is a good man but it just shows... Um how bad that that environment was that even a good man like him didn't see it, uh, didn't feel like it was right to stop it um, and doesn't remember it probably because it won't mean anything to him. Um, look, the bystanders, um, if you from now on especially, if you continue to just be bystanders and you're a 
we are as much of a problem as the guys who are perpetrators. I know you've said, and you've always said to me, this isn't a witch hunt, this isn't about me against a certain person, it's about an institution, but in terms of a one-word answer, should Gary Valance ever play for Yorkshire again? Should Andrew Gale ever coach a day? Should Martin Moxon ever continue to work there again? Um, I don't think Martin and Andrew can. Um, I think Gary, if he um, apologises properly, um, has some sort of acceptance, I feel he should be given some sort of accountability, whatever that may be. Um, I think he should be allowed to play. Um, but in terms of uh, Andrew and um, Martin, I don't think um, it's possible for Yorkshire to move forward with them still in there, knowing full well what sort of role they play in that institution. Talking of the institution, there were, there were parts of Roger Hutton's testimony yesterday that, that absolutely baffled me, but maybe don't surprise you. He didn't know about the Fletcher report that was published in 2014. He didn't have the power to remove the likes of Mark Arthur and Martin Moxon. And he didn't realise that the terms of the investigation had been changed and that the investigation had been asked not to directly address the question of institutional racism. I mean, that is the definition, isn't it, of institutional racism? Well, that's exactly how I was, I was going to answer it. Um, it's just, I mean, look, parts of that uh, testimony, I'm not sure he was being honest, if I'm being, if I'm being honest. Um, I don't think he's a bad blog. I just think he showed exactly why he couldn't do anything. I think I think he was very weak yesterday, and I think the fact that he doesn't know about the Fletcher report and this investigation had been going on for 18 months. It was one of the things that we articulated in our uh, evidence. Um, but the investigation that was set up by him, he didn't know that terms of reference changed. Something's not right there. Um, I think, and that's why it's disappointing that Mark and Martin didn't come, because I think the full picture would have been clearer if they'd turned up, but uh, clearly they've got a lot to hide. Um, but I just felt, I wish Roger had been a bit more um, honest and open about what had gone on. Did it feel cowardly from your perspective, the fact that Mark and, and Martin weren't there to give evidence? Well, I mean, throughout the 16 months I spoke to you at length, uh, they've used a local journalist at, at Yorkshire Post to say that how the, uh, they've got their side of the story, blah, blah, blah. And they had an opportunity yesterday to come down here under parliamentary privilege to get their side of the story across, and they didn't. Um, I think that should tell all the Yorkshire members that are still standing by the club or everyone. And, you know, even if after yesterday and the fact that they didn't turn up, you still think that they can be part of your club, then I'm sorry. That just shows how big the problem is. And you're not just part of the problem, you are the problem. You said that you feel, and I'm sure you've heard over the last 24 hours, that the floodgates might well open. How many more counties and more players do you think might come forward and how many more counties might be in a lot of trouble over the coming weeks? I think, I think you're going to get it in, uh, into the hundreds and thousands, possibly. Um, I think the trouble thing, it's the way they handle it. We've got here because of Yorkshire's handling of this. Um, yes, what happened was completely unacceptable but th the way they've handled it has made this issue a lot lot bigger uh, and showed them for what they are so I think um, it, it just depends how the game uh, individual counties and the ECB handle it I think ECB's realised that they messed up as well and they're not going to let another episode like this occur. Final few questions then um, you talked about the ECB there Tom Harrison promised yesterday to sort this out quickly Lord Patel is now in place as the chair of Yorkshire. Do you back Lord Patel to be able to turn the county round? And do you have any confidence that Tom Harrison's words will ring true? Um, look, Camlesh, right up to now, everything he's done uh, gives me a tiny little bit of hope. But I know the scrutiny is on at the minute, so they've got no other option. So I think he's going to be judged in a f weeks and months. But we're here watching. Um, and if it doesn't happen, be the first person to call it out. Um, I think the ECB need to accept that they've messed up as a start. And again, they've got a massive responsibility. As I said, it's their game. Um, the game relies on them. Um, and if it means taking actions like taking international cricket away or taking actions that which has far bigger implications, um, then they have to take it because actually this should be the first thing on their table and not commercial deals and corporate um, stuff. Um, I've felt your frustration so many times over the last year. You, you've spoken to me directly. I've, I've heard it in your voice. Do you think a day like this can, can help you find some peace? Yeah, I think yesterday has got me some sort of closure. Um, 
and look I I just I just want to make sure that if this is not another oh we're gonna set up an inquiry I'm not we're not interested we it's clear it's there we're not interested in PR initiatives we want tangible proper human action and all we're asking for is to be treated fairly and equally I don't think it's a lot to ask for Lastly then, the other thing that, that really struck a lot of people yesterday is that you said, I don't want my children to be involved in cricket. Do you ever see a day where that might change? Um, I hope so, um, but I'm a parent um, and until I see actions, until I see the game changing, I don't want my son to have the mental scars that I've got. No chance. Um, so as it stands, um, I hope so, but until the game changes, um, that won't be happening. MP Julian Knight, who chaired the DCMS chair committee in which Azim Rafiq gave his testimony yesterday, wants complete governance reform of cricket in this country and thinks the sport needs an organisation like Kick It Out to tackle racism and discrimination. We need to ensure that going forwards that we have a sport that is transparent and, and clean. And that means ultimately complete governance reform, in my view. This problem is clearly more deeply rooted than even I thought when I started off in, in, in this inquiry a few months ago. And what we need to do is ensure that the ECB actually has the powers in place and the oversight in place to get a hold of the counties so that we do not have a repeat well, the panel at yesterday's hearing was made up of seven men and two women, all of whom were white. The lack of diversity on it has been criticised, but Knight says there was nothing he could do about it. These individuals are elected by parliamentarians. So we, I have no choice as chair over who is actually on the panel. They are elected by parliamentarians. So that's a wider concept of whether or not you think the parliament, the UK parliament, is, is diverse enough. Uh, and I think that's an issue probably for the whole of parliament rather than the committee. I did, I did find that, I could understand why people probably find it a little bit disjointed. Journalist George Dobble first reported Rafiq's claims of racism against Yorkshire. He's been impressed by Rafiq's perseverance in the last 18 months. He was offered £105,000, I think it was, to shut up. He's had numerous threats uh, as recently as Friday. He was told when he went to the union that he didn't have a case. Uh, Yorkshire obviously ignored him time and time again. The ECB initially ignored him and he just wouldn't give up. His resilience is incredible. But the one message that I would want people to take away is that do not think that his experiences are unique. They are so far from it. The difference is that he forced his to be heard. And by doing that, I think he's encouraged lots of other people to come forward in the next few weeks. Listen, they're going to be grim. Our game is going to hear a lot of very, very disturbing testimony. And we've got to do that. We've got to go through that because we have to acknowledge we haven't been good enough and we have to be better.